So we'll touch on the local property market, uh, which is very topical right now, and then move on to offshore markets. By offshore markets, we mean developed property markets, and then offshore markets in South Africa is mainly like in Eastern Europe. So just probably just a uh, brief introduction on Stanley. We run uh, local and global property funds. We manage about uh, 20 billion rands of uh, assets in the local and uh, offshore uh, space. Stanley Property Income Fund and the Stanley uh, Global Property Fund. So talking about local listed property, as Simon mentioned, so things haven't been as uh, pretty as uh, before. And this chart is not, it's not quite familiar for us because we're used to property being at the top, so it's the best performing asset class. But year to date, uh, as you can see, it's down about 23%. So the best performing asset class is cash, followed by bonds at 3%, and then equity is down about 6%. So equities and property, not so good, but property has been in a tougher space year to date. And uh, the reasons for that, a couple of reasons, probably basically three reasons. I'll talk about that more in detail. First one is uh, due to the resilient stable of companies. There's about four companies there. Oh, it's four actually. Uh, Green Bay, uh, Napier Castle, Fortress, and Resilient. Those stocks were down anywhere between 40 and 60% this year. So that's dragged down the index, and they made up 40% of the index at the beginning of the year. And they're now down to about 27% because they've underperformed other uh, companies. And then second point will be the rand. As we move more into offshore markets, we've seen the currency actually uh, strengthen at the beginning of the year. So if the rand strengthens, it affects the companies exposed to offshore markets. So the beginning of the year, so most of these markets actually fall. So that's the second point. The third point is actually the economy, which affects basically all the markets. Beginning of the year, most economies were looking for almost 2% growth, and the number has been revised downwards to about a percent or so, if not below uh, 1%. So that's why our market actually has actually suffered because of that. Then let's go into detail. And look at actually, if you look at beginning of the year, it's only basically two months that actually have affected the property market. It's in January where the market was down 10% and then fell 10% again in February. So if you strip that out, you're basically, if I add this uh, March, April, all the way to October, we're down about 3%. So we've seen actually uh, the worst uh, from the listed property space when it's fallen 10% uh, per month for January and February. And then we saw a nice recovery. At some point when the market falls like this, you expect that recovery and market recovers 8%, some people take profits and then fell 6%, but it's kind of been stabilizing around the minus three plus 2% uh, levels. So to highlight that point again, we've seen actually um, uh, the, the West from the listed uh, property companies. It's about the outlook um, um, going forward. But let's go back to 1995. Let's say if you invest in the listed property market, but for us, actually, this period doesn't really count me from 1995 all the way to about 2002, because our sector was really, I was fairly young at that time. So we saw the markets, uh, probably the worst actually period has been minus 16% uh, from the listed property space. And then if you look at the modern kind of era of the property space, uh, property was down 5%, one of the best performers actually at that time compared to all other markets globally. So 5% down, and people are not used to it. I put this in red, actually, because down 23% is actually very... Uh, uh, shocking for most people and not everybody expected a kind of, uh, of fall. But if you look at the last 15 years, property has delivered 20% annualized actually uh, total returns <laughs> over the last uh, 15 years. But 2018, no doubt, has been actually very uh, uh, tough. And what the slide shows, it shows you the income component, those dark bars, that's your income. So year in, year out, you're getting actual income. So if you're actually focusing on income, and then you reinvest that income at the lower levels, you get actually more in terms of total returns. If you've got a long-term view, the income is still actually intact. The income is not actually going backwards in the property market. Year to date, our income so far around about 4% uh, levels. Actually from share prices, the shares are down 27%. And then 4% of that is income. I didn't put that break down there, but 4% year to date. And then uh, just probably one slide to show like what we hold in our portfolios. We're focusing more on the markets, not uh, the fund. Our biggest holdings in the portfolio will be Nepi Rock Castle. This company, is, you've got offshore exposure uh, in Eastern Europe. And our biggest holding is 14%, followed by Redefine about just under 13%, and then Growth Point. So I highlighted these companies here, because that's where most of the noise has been, Resilient and Fortress. So NEPI probably slightly different, but it's part, part of the stable, but focus doesn't hold uh, resilient or fortress. So you're getting purely Eastern European uh, property exposure. 
kind of SA Corporate, Vogile, and Investec Property Fund. That's our top 10 holdings. So I'd like to focus probably more on these companies here. What has happened? What has caused actually all this noise? So I call them the resilient group, but if you talk to them now, they don't want to be called the resilient group. Everybody's separate. Fortress is Fortress, Resilient, Green Bay, and Napier Rock Castle. But before, it used to be called a stable. So what were the concerns? So a couple of concerns raised. You saw some of this, uh, be it emails or media articles as well. First one is actually the Siaka Trust, which is a BE trust. So what they did here, they will get actually preferential rates are from the banks, and then they lend actually money to the trust at high interest rate. And that margin they make, they pay it out to investors as distribution. So that's not property income, so it's probably not sustainable. Most other companies do it, but they probably did it probably more than other companies, and that became actually bigger in terms of the earnings. So that has been eliminated, and actually the interest cost, and uh, for what they get from the banks, and then what they charge the trust is the same now. So there's no extra margin coming from that. So that's resolved. Second point is the cross holdings. So what are cross holdings? Resilient investors in Fortress. Fortress invested in Resilient. So I said, why should they invest in each other? So that actually Resilient sold the Fortress holding. So there's no cross holding between Resilient and Fortress. So they've been quick to react to most of these concerns raised by the market. The third point was actually the cash flow hole. There was a number, some emails and articles circulating around on WhatsApp and everywhere saying there's no money to pay out our distributions. So look at the financials. We've got a strong team of analysts who worked everything line by line. We couldn't find any cash actually missing. So there was actually cash. So these companies tend to actually uh, reinvest actually the, the distributions and they probably fund that with debt as well instead of actually paying out the cash. So if you match that out, there's no concerns around cash flow. So we're not concerned about that. The fourth point was actually inflated property values. So there were actually uh, accusations, allegations, or concerns that the, the property values are inflated. Personally, I've actually traveled across uh, the country. I've seen all the portfolios, uh, the quality of the portfolios, uh, the tenant profile, matched with all the center managers, the well-managed assets. So we didn't have a concern around the valuations and we worked out the numbers, compared that to redefine uh, growth point, the valuations were similar. So I said, okay, take away that concern. Let's change uh, the property values because when you have the same property value, then you question actually the valuations. So they changed uh, the values. They moved to JLL. That's John's Lang LaSalle. It's a global property company. And they started all the valuations from scratch, list by list, tenant by tenant. And they came up with valuations that are actually 4% higher, which reflects the quality of the portfolio. The last point is actually, no one can actually answer this. It's manipulation of share price, uh, insider trading. So waiting for the FSB or now the FSCA to come up with uh, their report. But in the meantime, we're busy working with uh, a number of uh, boards, whether it's Fortress, uh, Resilient, to kind of resolve this uh, quicker. There's lots of interactions. We had meetings with Fortress two days ago. We're going to meet with other companies as well over the next week to two weeks to accelerate uh, this process. So this is the biggest concerns that have raised uh, uh, that caused the market to fall between 40 to 60 percent amongst uh, this are stable. And then we change gears to look about the property sector, get a sense of what are we exposed to. If you invest in the property space, you've got about 53 percent exposure to retail uh, sector. That's your malls, uh, shopping centers, and then offices about 24 percent, industrial 15 percent. And then we've got this section called other, that's uh, storage. Probably seen all these buildings with red colors everywhere. They come into that sector. You do have residential as well, a few hospitals, but those are actually quite smaller compared to the global property markets. So I'll drill down into the sectors, get a sense of what's going on in the market. Let's start off with the office market. Probably as you're driving here to this presentation, we're going to offices or shopping. We see lots of these signs now. Like almost every second building in the office market, there's a too late sign outside. So it's a reflection of uh, two things, uh, oversupply, and actually a weaker office market. And then probably the third point will be uh, consolidation. You've seen actually most of the big corporates, uh, be it Sassel, Discovery, all consolidate into one actually big building and vacating buildings uh, in Runbeck and Bryanston. That's created vacancies. And these buildings here, they're more like in the B grade space. So you've got what you call A grade or P grade, that's the premium buildings. So if in this kind of space, you're actually not compelled to actually give discounts to uh, tenants. So it's actually a tenant's market right now. It's not a landlord's market. So Redefine says, uh, I'll give you 50% rent free uh, for two years. So I provide you something like maybe like a four year lease or five year lease. So for the next two years, 50% discount. On the right hand side, that's a city property. That's basically Octodec. So if you're giving 50% per year, let's just make it simple. I'll just give you one year rent, uh, rent free. 
And then what that causes, well, just causes actually the market to be more depressed. Everybody actually follows suit as well. Everybody combined to, to get uh, tenants. So the office market, very challenging. More so if you've got B grade office space. And then move on to P grade. That's a premium grade, prime grade space. You've seen these buildings actually, we took these pictures uh, two months ago. So just completed. This building is quite fascinating. Uh, Momentum was actually looking more here from Centurion and we hear that they're moving in. So they have to find actually somebody else to take that space. And then here looking at uh, probably these buildings on average, I would probably say 30 to 40% vacant. So brand new buildings, 30 to 40% are vacant. And uh, what happens to the B grade buildings, uh, to keep these buildings, you have to pay rents and taxes, are the security, this, that. At some point, landlords have to discount their rents just to keep these buildings uh, operating. So office market is our least favorite sector right now. And we try to be as underweight as we can to this uh, sector. Then move on to the industrial space which has been actually the best performing uh, sector. This market is actually seeing actually a change uh, more from manufacturing to warehousing and distribution. The South African economy, we don't manufacture things anymore. Everything is manufactured from China. So we distribute that through these uh, warehouses. So you're seeing that shift from the older buildings to the newer buildings, because the old buildings, you don't have the right height, you don't have the right floors, you don't have actually good tanning circles for trucks. So you're finding that if you're in the new space, you're actually better positioned as over some of the old industrial space. So there's going to be more vacancies in the old industrial space. And the question is, what happens to those actually buildings? So that we probably change them to storage or probably a residential. I've seen residential conversions as well from industrial space. And some as well, you see like uh, churches as well, churches occupying the space. But you don't make money from a church because church only trades once a week. So basically on Sundays or maybe on a Wednesday. So it's not really actually good income. So there's so much supply coming through in this market in the industrial uh, space. And then move on to the retail sector. So the retail sector has been fairly strong on average versus actually the, the national averages. Average uh, property uh, retail sales uh, has been uh, flat across uh, the country, whereas local property companies have achieved basically anywhere, uh, probably between 2 and uh, 4%. Let's talk about limited two degrees, that's basically Sant and City Eastgate in this space. So Sant is growing about 2.8% sales growth year on year, whereas national average, we're flat. And then food count, we're seeing actually numbers decline by about 6% year on year. So why is that? Weaker economy, as well as uh, increased uh, supplies, so, so much competition. Then we have these uh, companies here, highlighted actually in navy or black, that's Mass and Napier Castle, that's Eastern Europe. That's Bulgaria, that's Romania, they're all growing their sales year on year at about 8%. So Eastern Europe has been very actually uh, strong and we've got actually big exposure to those markets. So EPP is also in Eastern Europe. So they're actually flat, that's Poland. What Poland has done is the government has said actually there's no more trading on Sundays. So Sundays, malls are closed. So that's why the sales are actually flat. But if you strip out Sunday, look at the numbers on a like-for-like -like basis, we're looking at about over almost 10% are sold our growth. So that's a probably new dynamic in Poland where you can't trade on Sundays. So, so much supply coming through uh, in a weak environment. Uh, we've just picked two buildings here. That's uh, Konubia Mall in Devon. It's quite interesting as well. Go to Devon, Gateway is right across the highway, yet you've got a new mall that's come up. So competing head on with Gateway and Gateway is doing an extension as well to extend that mall to almost 200,000 square meters. On the right hand side, that's Four Ways Mall. Four Ways Mall is about closer to about 70,000 square meters, and they're doing a 100,000 square meter extension. Just to give you a perspective, 100,000 square meters is almost the same size as Eastgate Shopping Center. That's the extension coming up in Four Ways Mall. And the challenge is there's going to be competition with Santon City, with Mall of Africa. It's probably more like a, a triangle where there's malls actually competing with, with each other and that will drag down actually sales across actually all the retail centers. And if your sales are down, it affects your rental uh, growth on average. So you want to be in a stronger dominant shopping center, but the market actually is challenging because of uh, that. And not only that, we've had actually lots of store closures. Sellafords probably is in the numbers already. It was challenging last year when Sellafords closed. Nine West is gone, Mango is gone, River Island is gone. And then the biggest concern now is Edcon. Edcon occupies almost 1.5 million square meters of space, and they're looking to uh, close about 500,000 square meters of space. So reduce space by one third. And it's happening already, some of that. And in some of the malls, for example, like in Mall of Africa, they've got two levels. They're going to cut actually one level from what we hear. And uh, they're going to close down like all the standalone, like CNA, uh, Red Square, all integrate them into the main store. 
So you're going to see probably lots of uh, pockets of vacancies as they integrate everything into one store and reduce by about one third in terms of space. So you want to be the markets where there's demand for that. Like Mall of Africa, for example, they say they found a tenant to take up the wall of floor that's going to be potentially vacated by Edcon. So the big question is, how big is Edcon in the listed property space? So we'll break this down by a number of companies. So the companies mostly exposed to Edcon will be Hyprop, uh, Resilient, that's Vugile. So this is actually JSC uh, share codes. And then let's say Liberty 2 Degrees there as well. And then some like 1% to 2%. So on average, these companies are probably seeing about maybe about 3.5% exposure, if you add these ones, to Edcon. But if we add the total portfolios plus offshore portfolios, our exposure to Edcon is about 2.3%. So it's not as big as people think if you look at national numbers. On average, Edcon occupies about uh, 6 to 7% of total retail space in South Africa. And of the traditional malls, Edcon is almost 10%. So it does actually have a ripple uh, effect across maybe most of these markets. And how to position your portfolio, we try to balance actually that exposure to, uh, to Edcon. Then move on to the offshore markets now. So in this section, before we go to the developed markets, we're talking about offshore available on the JSE. So companies on the JSE, and it's half of that is Eastern Europe. That's what you're getting. So when you invest in these companies, in the local market, you're getting a bit of UK, and a bit of uh, Eastern Europe. So South Africa is now 62%, and then offshore makes up uh, almost uh, 40%. This is quite an interesting chart. I'll try to simplify it. So Africa or rest of Africa, out of favor. There's no property companies actually expanding to the rest of uh, the continent now, because they've been have challenging periods, uh, they've tr struggled to trade. And in fact, actually most of the malls that opened in the rest of the continent have vacancies, huge vacancies, 10, 20%. And that model hasn't worked because of uh, mainly commodity cycle as well. Difficult to take money back, uh, currencies. Like in Zambia, they just change overnight from, uh, Zim, uh, from, from US dollars to quarters. So then your list is in dollars, now they've converted to quarters as well. So it's been a challenging market. So most companies, given the challenges in South Africa, they're going to Eastern Europe. But these actually states are quite amazing. Of all the money going to Central and Eastern Europe in the real estate space, in 2016, 80% came from South Africa. And then that was a high base, 2016. Go to 2017, 60% of just all the cash going into Eastern Europe is South African money. And just give you some examples. These are the malls we invested in. If you go to Bulgaria and Sofia, the top three malls are owned by South African companies. And we visit all these companies. I actually took all these pictures over the side visits. Just get a sense of how they trade. As I mentioned, they're doing 7 8% sales growth. Good tenants, you've got your Mango, you've got Tommy Hilfiger, you've got all those European, you've got LCY, Kiki, they do very well. And then Paradise Center, that's the best mall actually in Sofia. We talk to people on the ground, they love this shopping center and trades very well. And then we've got Sedica Shopping Center as well, doing well. Then we go to Romania. Actually, Romania is quite interesting. Actually, in fact, almost all the malls there are owned by South African companies. We dominate that retail space uh, in Romania. And some of them are built from scratch with South African money, like Mega Mall, that's uh, built uh, by Nepi. This one was acquired, that looking to do an extension here, build more office block. And then in Constanta, which is more like a Deben of Romania, that's where everyone goes for their summer holidays and parties. They've done a huge extension there as well, and it's trading uh, well. And we go to Croatia, go to Hungary, go to Poland. These are the malls we're exposed to in our portfolios. And it's very good malls, as you can see, modern malls, well-designed, good tenants, and trading are very well. So the concern is, okay, why is actually all the money actually coming from South Africans? Talk to people from uh, France, uh, from uh, Germany, from UK. They won't really actually look at Eastern Europe. The seat is very risky. Some think it's actually corrupt as well. But for us, it's probably a relative game where we see actually better growth uh, prospects. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's happening. So it's, again, I think I'm better off in Romania. And, um, and if you look at the GDP growth numbers as well, uh, so we are growing at 1% or less. Uh, Romania last year grew at 7%. So it's slowing down to about, uh, let's say, 5.5%. So this is 2017 all the way to 2022. So the focus is on average, you're looking at about 3% GDP growth from these markets of a high base. And so three times better growth than South Africa. Not just uh, uh, GDP growth, we look at unemployment. Unemployment for us, we've been stuck at, let's say 30%. I don't know what the official number is, I said 30%. That number hasn't changed for the last 10 or 15 years. But these markets, you can see the trends as well, right across unemployment coming down. So as unemployment comes down, that means there's more people to shop, there's more demand for properties, there's more demand for office space, and these markets will actually trade well, relatively speaking, 
despite some of uh, the risks that actually have been raised uh, by people. Then we talk about uh, LTVs in the sector. So that's your loan to value ratios. That's the debt uh, from these property companies across the sector. So long term average has been 32%. So this number is actually trending upwards to 37%. So most of the time these companies are able to raise equity if they're finding opportunities. But now that property is out of favor, it's difficult for most companies to actually come out and say they need money. So you have to go to the bank instead. So there's two ways of raising actually money, go to the bank or raise equity. So they're now going to the banks, that's why 37%. So this number is not terrible. So 40% for us is the cutoff point. Above 40% is considered probably unacceptable in the local property market. But it is actually a little bit of a worry, uh, trending uh, upwards. Then look at the yields. The yields actually have been, uh, they're getting more attractive. Your long-term average yield, probably say just about just over 9%, that's your long-term average yield. So just to give you an example, let's say you invested in January in 2000, your yield was about 17%. That's the average yield from the property sector. But this long-term average, over 9%, and currently we're heading to almost 10% forward yield. So the yields are higher than the 10-year bond yields in South Africa, better than they were actually before. So if you look at 2013, the yield was almost 5%. So it's almost doubled over the last uh, four years or so, four or five years. So at these levels, we see properties actually looking better, more attractive than before, off a low uh, base. And then from an NAV perspective, so your net asset value in simple terms is just the value of your physical property. So no, before we'll pay almost uh, up to 60% above what your property is worth, which is actually very expensive. So anything above this line, we we'll consider that expensive. So long term average, the market is willing to pay 18% above your net asset value. So currently the sector is trading at 3% below net asset value. So it means you're getting a physical property uh, cheaper. So we believe that property in general should trade at a premium to NAV. You should probably pay more compared to your physical asset. Why is that? You've got diversification. You've got uh, liquidity. You've got different managers as well. You've got the ability to switch from retail to office to industrial. Compared to somebody holding, if you've got only one building, you've got probably concentration risk. You're in the wrong node. You've probably one or two tenants and something else comes up, then you're actually in trouble. And try, for example, selling your apartment. Uh, the number of show days, you have to leave home for four or five weekends. And then once you find a buyer, then you've reduced the price. And then afterwards, then it's three to six months transfer process, whereas the listed market very liquid. To give an example, actually it takes two to three days to trade some of these counters. You've got your cash. So don't underestimate the value of uh, liquidity. It's actually liquidity equals value. Without liquidity, you can't determine what your value is. So we think the sector now is looking better. Uh, our point is certainly our focus is actually income. We like to focus on income, capital return uh, over time. And this slide is quite interesting. So what we've done here is we've looked at the returns from 2005. So base them 200. And then if you invest in 2005, you'll have made uh, 100, let's say 100% uh, capital return. That's a share price growth is up 100%. But from a total return perspective, you've made 400%. But what's the biggest component is income. Income is 300% of that. So that means, as I said earlier on, that's the power of compounding. You get that income, you reinvest it, continue reinvesting as well. Don't touch it when you don't need it. And then that gives you actually much higher total returns. Whereas the market tends to look at share prices. No one asks about yield. No one asks actually where is actually the income going. At Stanley, we focus on income and then capital growth uh, over time. So to conclude in the local property market, uh, what's the upside and downside? Upside, obviously, if the economy grows at 3 4%, like we saw in 2005, 7, 8, 9, that would be actually very good uh, for the property market. And we need, actually, when the rent weakens, it's actually positive for the property market. As I mentioned, offshore exposure is uh, 40%. It's a 40%. And that 40% is growing at a faster rate than the 60%. And that means when the rent is weaker, you're getting more distributions, more income when you take it back to South Africa. So that's why when the rent weakens, we are kind of actually happy when you look at these companies we are invested in. Corporate action, valuation divergence, some stocks are up 40, 60%, they could be takeover targets. And you've seen when companies get taken out, they tend to pay 15, 20% uh, premiums, mostly in the offshore markets. So you pay 20% above where the share is actually trading at. And then the resilience table, the market actually needs clarity on this. That's one third, almost one third of the sector. So if there's a positive outcome, that's good for the sector. And rate cuts as well, though probably unlikely at this stage. On the downside, Edcon is a big concern still, um, 
and then uh, investor hesitation to the sector because everyone's reading about the bad news every day. Uh, it's all about resilient and the market falling 20, 25%, but we believe it's actually better based to be actually exposed to the sector. And then tenant consolidation, big corporates, they're actually consolidating. So the days of offices and uh, big offices, corner offices, they're gone. It's mostly open plan system. It's standard will probably work more like in a classroom where everyone's just sitting next to each other. The corporate is actually cutting costs. They want actually people to sit actually like that and save money. And discovery, hot desking as well, and the ability to work from home. We've seen most companies in the global space, probably if you employ 10,000 people, the office only caters for 8,000 people because the other 2,000 can actually work uh, from home. So that's uh, the local property market, a bit challenging, but if you look at the yields over 9.5, almost 10%, growing at 5 to 6%. So it's lower than before, but we believe actually it's better uh, entry level compared to uh, last year. Then we'll move on to the offshore markets. So but offshore markets here will mean uh, developed property markets. We're not, talking, we're not going to talk about Eastern Europe. We're done with Eastern Europe now. We'll move on to Western Europe and uh, the US and Australia and the UK. How this market performed here to date? So this is in dollars. It's kind of a bit of a tricky slide. So let me try to explain this. So the market, if you look at the dark brown line, that's the global property market. So the world is down about 2.5% year to date. And then Japan is the only market that's up, up, up about 4% there about. And then the worst performer will be actually, obviously, it's the UK because of uh, Brexit, there's so much noise in the UK, and then Hong Kong, Singapore. And then property on average, apart from Japan, if this box is above zero, that means properties outperformed equities. So in Japan, properties outperformed equities by about 3%. Whereas in the US, US equities are flying, properties underperformed equities by 11%. So equities have been doing well in the US. Property, why is it uh, underperforming relative equities? It's because of interest rates. So when bond deals go up, rates go up, the market panics in the short term. That's why property here is actually underperformed. So, but in rent terms, property is up over 10% because the rent is weakened year to date. Everyone looks at their statements in rent and we're looking at about 10% to 11% uh, total uh, returns. So let's talk about the standard global property fund. Just give you a perspective of what the market actually looks like. So if you invest uh, in the fund, which probably gives a general picture of uh, global markets, US is about 57%, followed by Japan. Japan is actually continues to do well, 8% Japan. And then Germany about 6%, uh, France 2.3%, then we keep about 2% cash in our portfolios. So our style is not to keep cash. We let you do the asset allocation, we do the stock selection. So our cash is for liquidity purposes, not to time the market. And some people can say, now why do you have 2% cash? Is that enough when you've got outflows? This fund is about, uh, combined money is about 2.5 billion rand in this fund. And if everybody wants their money, in three to five days, we can actually pay you back. That's how liquid these markets are in the offshore markets. So we're actually very tiny in these uh, markets and there's so much liquidity. On the right hand side, these are some of the biggest companies in the world. So you can see the US, almost top pay is actually in the US. Salmon Property Group, these companies are actually bigger, each of these companies bigger than the world South African listed property sector combined. Salmon Property Group, that's retail, Prologis Industrial, this is self storage, residential, offices in New York City, in uh, Washington, Boston, and then that's residential, that's storage, residential, retail, residential. So you can see we've got lots of residential in our portfolios. Why do we like residential? There's actually a shift in the world where people are actually renting instead of buying. Most of the younger people. There's actually, millennials enjoy actually uh, 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 buying things instead of owning things. So people like to, they don't want to be tied up to all these uh, apartments and loans and everything else. So this market actually continues to uh, do well. And we like Germany. Germany has actually done very well in our portfolios and the economy is operating at full employment. In fact, Germany is actually big in our portfolios as you can see, 7%, all German residential. And Germany is doing so well that they actually run out of people actually to employ. So when they actually send out CVs, only half of the people turn up for interviews. And now they have to go to Poland. To employ police as well, they're going to Poland. And they're going to teach them German as well just for them to come back. So then we like actually that market and residential continues to do well. And look at this breakdown of the sector. Retail sector is the biggest. So in South Africa, it's three sectors basically. It's industrial, office, and retail. So here we've got retail, there's residential, but quite tiny here, these sectors. We've got industrial, we've got hotels, we've got healthcare, we've got diversified. We've got specialized as well. So under specialized, you do have uh, different companies. We've got uh, like your data centers, you've got prisons as well in the portfolio. So we like prisons, because prisons, you can lock in your tenants, and you know they're not gonna move any uh, out anytime uh, soon. 
So lots of prison companies actually in the US. Then to, that's retail, that's prison mm -hmm. companies Most actually in the US. Look at the retail, retail that's, as I mentioned, the US is doing very well. But looking at their retail portfolios, Boston, LA, San Francisco, New York, rents are falling despite a strong US economy. So everybody wonders why. Whereas other markets, London's doing well, Tokyo, I see that as well, Madrid, Spain actually would like Paris, uh, Paris, Moscow, all actually actually picking up. This is positive, that would be negative uh, rental uh, growth. But the most worrying is this one, why is US actually falling? And the answer is, US has got actually more shopping center space per capita compared to any other country in the world. So you can see 2.19 here, um, GLA per square meter per capita. And department stores make up almost half of the shopping centers. Let's start with this section here. So we've got more shopping centers uh, per capita, and then online shopping is actually picking up much faster in the US. So as online shopping takes over, it affects companies with more shopping center space. And then that's why US actually seeing lots of store closures. Last year, almost uh, 7,000 stores closed down in the US, more than actually 2008, because of that shift from actually physical retail to online shopping. You've got more. And then department stores, 46%, almost half of the space is department stores like your Stella Foods, Edgar's in the, shop, in the shopping centers in the US. And department stores are a fading concept. Everyone's moving away from department stores. No one wants to shop in four, five, six level uh, shopping center or department store with different brands. You're not getting actually that personal attention. That's why we're moving more to like uh, individual boutique stores. Each brand wants to own their space and they can actually sell their product are better and that's what people actually prefer. So US, lots of department stores closing down. They're on average looking at about 15 to 20% department store space. So US has got more than double that kind of space. And what are department stores in the US? So the major ones will be uh, Macy's. We've got JC Penny. So these ones have shut down hundreds of stores, probably more than 200 stores over the last two years or three years. And that's uh, Roosevelt uh, Field Mall, does actually very well. Still has Macy's, JC Penny. They haven't closed everything because uh, in the best shopping centers, they continue to trade uh, very well. So we're exposed to these markets. So if in the right shopping center, we've got the food count. This mall is 210,000 square meters. It's the 11th uh, largest mall uh, in the US and does very well. It's about almost 98, 99% uh, let. So we like Simon Property Group because they've got the best shopping centers and everybody wants to win Simon Property Group's uh, portfolio to a point whereby actually the rental growth in their portfolio is higher than sales growth. So it turns out it's fine. I can pay a higher rent even if I'm selling less because everybody moved to the store and they can come here, have food, entertainment, beverage, go back home, shop online, it doesn't matter for the retailer. So they'll pay more in the big dominant stores. And some malls actually do very well as well. So not all malls actually uh, probably in the peripheral areas, some are actually central. This opened a few, about two years ago, or three years ago. It's right by the World Trade Center. So right below here, next to the side, you've got the World, uh, what do you call it, the 9-11 Memorial site. So we've got lots of tourists coming in here as well. So food, beverage, entertainment doing well. And then this connects actually uh, like New Jersey, uh, Brooklyn, and then Manhattan. So lots of people actually moving in lunchtime, evening, early in the morning, grabbing coffee, having some croissant as well. Does very well. We love this shopping center. We're exposed to that. So this is actually probably immune to online shopping because people always come visit this place. And then we go to France, uh, Paris. Uh, we took this it was December last year. Just get a sense of what retailers are doing, not just the landlords. So a tenant called Andes. I don't know what it means. Maybe it's French, but Andes, that's the name. So what they do here, they employ one person or two people at most in the store. And then you've got these screens here. So when you come here, they only put one item on the hanger. You don't put five jackets. You don't put size 46, 47, 50. You only put one. So whatever you like, you look at the screen, you order from the screen. And one person helping you out. And where does it come from? It comes all the way from the roof. There's a computer and things doing clever things at the top there. It comes straight down to you. So on your own, you pay with your card, off you're gone. You're not going to wait for these long queues and everything else. And if you probably don't like it, just uh, you leave it there and then off you go. So that's the technology people are using there to make it easy to check out. You don't spend too much time actually in a shop, in a shop and say, you know what you like, you know your size and your art. And then what else actually uh, are the retailers doing? That's uh, Waitress. That's basically uh, the Woolies or Woolies of, uh, of uh, the UK. So what they do here is that as you walk into the store, you pick up this uh, call it quick uh, checkout handset and then you carry a basket. As you put stuff in a basket, you just scan it, scan it, and then by the time you get in front, you know actually how much you're going to spend. You've probably have seen that we get delayed by people in front of the queue. They have to take out things and everything, I guess. But this one, by the time you get, you know everything. Then just pay, you're quick, out you go. 
And then put Amazon as well, moving into the shopping centers with the, uh, the pickup up points. You click, on, you click on the website, then you collect again the mall. Because they know that half the time, most people are not at, at home. So if you pass by a shopping center, probably convenient, easy to get in, you pick up your stuff. But as you know, when you go into a shopping center, you end up buying coffee, you want to buy flowers, you want to buy this as well. So it attracts actually more sales in a shopping center. So that's been one of the biggest strokers uh, in the malls as Amazon moves in. The other one is actually electric cars. Slowly in South Africa, but in if it's Europe, uh, Amsterdam, Norway, there's lots of electric cars there. And the malls actually partner with Tesla. You have the charging points in the mall. It takes you an hour to charge your car, one and a half hours. But you're going to sit in your car for one and a half hours. You end up working around, and it's more like discounted rates, available rates there. You buy a coffee, you end up buying something else, and that actually draws people into the shopping uh, centers. And then games as well. So like younger people love playing games and uh, so this game actually is saying for you to play it, you can't play it sitting at home. You can't play it on your couch. It actually encourages people to move and it's more like a virtual game. So, so Unibar Redemco has got exclusivity in, in Europe where for you to download maybe the latest monster, you have to go to their mall. And you see lots of people walking around trying to catch these monsters as well. And then they probably can't catch the monster at some point, you've got to rest and buy coffee, ice cream, exchange notes as well. And these monsters actually saw that in Central Park in New York, uh, there was a rare monster they introduced. It attracted almost 200,000 people in Central Park. And to say Justin Bieber was there, but no actually could recognize Justin Bieber. That's how popular actually this game uh, is. And these malls are actually using that a lot, and uh, it attracts a lot of people in the malls. And then food. Food's actually become a big thing. People love these uh, gourmet burgers, uh, there's coffee shops all coming up. It's a new concept in malls. And uh, food, beverage, and entertainment was about 5% in malls. It was probably more like food cuts as opposed to the nice mix that we see nowadays. And the standard right now, you're looking at about 20 to 25% in the malls. And how does it help? They're saying actually 40% of visitors going to a mall, they base that on the dining options available. So the more concerts we have, all these Mexican restaurants, the sushis and everything else, it draws a lot of people. And people tend to spend 35 minutes longer where there's actually nice food, and then the spend goes up 12%. So most of the malls, they're actually increasing that component, food, beverage, entertainment. And then apps. So if you've got a mall that doesn't have an app nowadays, it's very old school. So everybody actually now is actually developing amazing apps where actually this is um, Unibar Redemco. So they've got 50 million visits. Uh, so you can browse through what's available in the shopping center. You can even order food. By the time you get there at lunchtime, your food is ready. You don't have to have an Ananda's app, Deer's app and that. There's only one app which is linked to the other ones. And they know what the opening hours are. And then this smart map is quite amazing. You actually, um, by the time you leave home, you just say, I want to go to Edgar's. It will tell you, use entrance six. And then when you get there, it tells you where to park. So the most frustrating thing for most of us is actually finding parking. So this app actually helps you. That's your smart parking. And then after you've done your shopping as well, the time you, you get lost, whether it's level one or level two, this app will tell you, no, that you're in level one, and then takes you straight to your, to your car. So it becomes more interesting to do uh, shopping. And then they partner with Uber as well. In fact, some malls are actually building less parking nowadays because we've seen some statistics. Younger people are not buying cars. They're not getting licenses. So there's no point actually building shopping and lots of parking. And that parking is being converted to food, beverage, entertainment, uh, storage, and your Uber collection points. And then you click on collections activities. And then put the Facebook, Instagram. Everybody's on Facebook, Instagram. So what the malls are doing now, they come up with all these Instagrammable kind of features, nice features. People take selfies and that, and they share. And that attracts a lot of people. So social media apps are actually very critical, as well as free Wi-Fi. So like these malls here, they provide you with free Wi-Fi, unlimited, unlike our malls where they give you 30 megabytes and it's run out in two minutes or five minutes. And uh, then you've got charging points as well. So you can charge your, your like every 100, 100 meters, 50 meters, you can charge your phone. They're saying actually the amount of time people spend actually in a mall is determined by the battery life. So the longer actually battery is full actually, then you spend more time in a mall. So they provide you charging points, which are actually for free. And that actually takes, makes people stay longer in the malls. Those are fascinating things that we see as we travel to these markets. Then we move on to the industrial sector. We love the industrial sector. That's the best performing sector actually globally right now. We're looking at rental growth on average in dollars about 10%. And there's no markets generally we're seeing actually rents falling. So most markets are sitting around here where rental growth is actually positive uh, and accelerating. And industrial markets all linked to e-commerce uh, logistics as opposed to manufacturing. So talking about e-commerce, how big is e-commerce? In China, it's almost 14%. And then our US growing quite a lot is about 13%. Western Europe at eight, Mexico 2%. South Africa, 
1.5%. And we're growing about 10% up here. We don't see actually South Africa going to these 10, 12% levels because of challenges around uh, logistics, distribution, uh, the cost as well of doing that. So it will grow, but not at a fast uh, rate. So you do have take a lot. I know most of you use take a lot. And if you look at what people order from take a lot, what do you think is actually the two actually best selling products on, on take a lot? Is what? TVs. TVs? Games. Games. It's actually nappies and pet food. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so snaps and pet food, this is all the bulky items where people don't want to be carrying it as well. So those are best selling actually categories on take a lot. It's not shoes, it's not clothing. So you see the uh, online shopping is quite different to other markets. And I look at uh, the rental growth, we love the industrial sector. So we expect this trend to actually continue for the next probably three to four or five years. It is actually demand is actually huge. So mainly because uh, for modern logistics space, uh, you probably need, you can't use the old buildings. So like in the US now, they have to actually build at least 20% new warehouses just to cater for current demand. In China, they have to build more than five times more they have now for current demand, not for future demand. In Europe, you have to double that as well. So we see actually huge growth in these uh, markets as online shopping picks up. And this slide shows quite nicely. These are the focus for e-commerce, that's globally. You can see that number actually accelerating and some people actually say it's going to be about 25% or so in the next uh, five years. And who's going to benefit more is the logistics industrial companies. And the challenge with logistics, people want same day deliveries nowadays or overnight deliveries. But for you to do overnight, it has to be as close as possible to where people live. And if you're as close as possible where people live, you can't actually have probably the best lane. So everyone's competing for that lane to do that kind of deliveries. And that will help to drive actually the industrial uh, rental market. Amazon. Amazon is very topical nowadays. If you talk about online shopping, everyone talks about Amazon. So what we've done here, we've tried to break it down in terms of all the categories in the Amazon's uh, probably business, what they're selling. So food and beverage now is actually the fastest growing category. So 40% up year on year as people order food. But so on average, you're looking at about 30% uh, sales growth in Amazon's portfolio. So compare that to the year's sales growth on average, retail sales less than 5%. Amazon growing like uh, six times more than actually your average national sales. That's the shift to uh, online shopping. Uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, facilities, they can't actually get everything they need. So some of that as well, it's being built for Amazon. They need more space around that as close as possible where people live and it's actually a challenge. So everybody's actually catering for Amazon. And they're looking to build a new head office and the size of the head office is going to be 1 million square meters. So they came up with the tenders to various states in New York that uh, they want initially 100,000 square meters, 100,000, but with the potential to expand that to 1 million square meters. So 1 million square meters is like a uh, sentence cities, 150,000 square meters. That's a lot of sentence cities just for head office and for Amazon. So we love Amazon. And what they've done now, they're actually shifting, not just online. They're actually going into real estate. Uh, so like buying actually some of the retailers. So Wolfville's market, it's more like a Woolies as well of, uh, of the US. Amazon's bought it. So they get closer to the customer, closer to the consumer, and understand uh, all the, uh, the numbers and the purchasing, actually, uh, kind of how they purchase, what they like as well. So they're actually diversifying uh, their portfolio and they continue to grow. Then move on to the office market. Office market globally, unlike in South Africa, probably is not, uh, it's not as bad, it's actually positive. Go to New York City, go to Sydney, Madrid, uh, Germany, there's strong rental growth, strong demand across all those markets. Australia is growing about 7 to 8%. Last year, Australia is growing at about 25 to 30% rental growth. So slowing down about 7 because of these columns are growing very well. Huge demand from banks, from law firms, uh, from architect firms, from engineering firms, so right across, as well as tech firms. Tech firms now make more than 20% of demand for office, office space as we move more into the technological uh, cycle. But things are changing as well in the office market. It's not a traditional office market space. So now it's more about co-working and flexible office workspace. So the days actually where companies want to sign 15, 20 year leases, who don't sign 15, 20 year leases? Because you don't know where you're going to be in 15 years. So we've seen actually these companies in the flexible work space come up with nice environments where you've got a design office, you've got killer coffee, lovely lunches, smiling receptionists, and meeting rooms on demand. So you pay as, as and when you need it. Not just a big meeting room that you only use once or twice a week. So those days are actually uh, going away. And this sector is actually making up almost 20% of demand of space being taken up now. Whereas like five years ago, it was less than 10%. So it's more than doubled in the last uh, uh, five years. 
and we expect this sector to continue to grow. So that space is, you've seen this company as well in South Africa. We haven't seen this one, WeWork. WeWork is now the biggest uh, office company in the world. This company was launched not so long ago, it's less than 10 years old. And it's now worth almost uh, between 30 and $40 billion. That's almost twice the size of the biggest office company in the world, which is Boston Properties. And it's growing at a faster rate. So before this, you just listen, and now they're actually buying buildings as well. And not only targeting like your smaller businesses, uh, your millennials, even the banks like Merrill Lynch, City as well, they're also using WeWork for some of their facilities and they're seeing the office market change. So what's special about them? They're saying, focus on growing your business, we take care of the rest. So like, don't worry about having coffee machines, we take off that front desk, private booths, fresh water, craft beer as well, champagne functions as well for your clients. You don't worry about that. You just tell them what you need to do, they do it for you. And if you're in New York, San Francisco, you can actually move and change uh, offices uh, easily. And this is actually the biggest uh, growing segment in the office market at this stage. So the other sector that we like is actually self-storage. As I mentioned, residential apartments, more and more exposure, but they're small, you find most of them like 30, 40, 50 square meters. You can't have everything in that apartment, so use self-storage. So in the US, 10% uh, of Americans use it. Uh, that's doubled in the last uh, five years as people are moving more into uh, the uh, CBDs away from the suburban areas. So people are willing to actually take smaller space in order to be more central. And that's probably a better life instead of you driving an hour, one and a half hours to work. But you're going to have extra stuff. You're going to have your skiing stuff. You're going to have your price thing that you're going to use in, summer, in winter. You put in the self-storage. And this sector has been actually doing well for some time. Then Times Square. You probably see that a lot in the movies and TV. We do have exposure in, this, uh, in these buildings. Uh, all these screens here, that's rental income. So all the landlords actually compete uh, to have the best screens, the best LED or LCD screens, colorful ones, and they collect the rent. And that rent comes to these companies. That's another company, that's Vernado Realty Trust. So this picture, we took it at midnight, 12 o'clock, still buzzing at midnight. And all the retailers do very well here. That's the strongest segment of New York City. Get all these funny people here. This looks like a child, a baby, and then some people dancing there as well, people taking selfies. Everybody goes to Manhattan. We love that. So shift gears now, we talk about interest rates, because that's the biggest concern now. So what's the concern with interest rates? So Sam Zell is actually the owner of Equity Residential. He's made lots of money. He's worth about seven, eight billion dollars. Uh, one of the wealthiest uh, people in the U.S. He likes to speak in a very simple uh, way. He says rates are going to go up because employment is going up. So if employment goes up, you fill your apartments, your office buildings get filled, so you're actually getting more rental income. So you may lose out on the capital a bit as the market reacts to high interest rates, but your income, as I mentioned earlier on, will grow at a faster rate than before. So that means a combination of high interest rates and actually um, and, and real estate actually benefits from that. The high interest rates and rental growth, very positive for these markets. So let's try to prove that. So look at this chart. The blue sections show the rate hiking periods. So this is a recent rate hiking periods. Look at what happened to property. So property corrects before the rate hike and then goes up. So you've seen that go up and then corrected before just the last week's rate hike two weeks ago and then it will probably go up again. So when rates go up, don't run away from property. As long as rates are going up because the economy is doing well. And we've seen that as well over this cycle. We've seen that over this cycle as well. So property doesn't really fall when rates are going up. Because by that time it happens, it's actually too late for you actually to be uh, trying to sell. The market left corrected, but I look forward in terms of our income growth. And then talk about earnings growth versus GDP, strong correlation between earnings growth and GDP. So the dark line is basically, uh, that's your property earnings per share growth. And then the light line, that's your GDP growth. So you need GDP growth to drive the property market. But as GDP goes up, what happens to your rates? Rates go up as well. But we focus on income, capital growth uh, over time. So an average, long term average in dollars, 8% earnings growth from global property companies. And then NAV perspective, in the global market space, you're getting assets at 8% below net asset value. So that means 8% below what the physical buildings are worth. So this market is actually more cheaper than South Africa more diverse, more liquid, more sectors as well in this market. And we believe at these levels actually very uh, attractive. So we prefer global property as opposed to local uh, property in our portfolios. And same slide that uh, I presented earlier on on the local market. In the offshore markets, because it's been through a much more challenging period. That's the subprime crisis where the markets fell quite a lot, up to like 60% or so in a year. And the capital return in dollars, 20%. And your total return, 110%. That means 90% came from income. So by reinvesting that income, you get actually much higher total returns. 
And capital has actually really moved. If you look at from like 2013, property has been pretty flat. So what's been driving that is that income that you'll reinvest to get a high total return. And to conclude, we're looking at about 4.5% yield in dollars. So that's higher than the US 10 year bond yield at about 3.3 there about. So you're getting much higher bond uh, return from a yield perspective and growing at about five to 6% in dollars. So everything here is quoted in dollars. We're not converting to, to rand, but be aware that there is actually volatility uh, coming from our currency movements. If you look at our currency, year to date, it's probably moved up, up and down a lot. If you take a long-term view, three years, five years, we love the sector. What's the upside? Upside, GDP growth still positive, M&A activity as well. We've seen in this space, actually on average, companies being taken out, it's been about 20% to 25% premiums. Like into last week, there was an announcement that uh, there's actually potential uh, takeover going on. The share was up 25% in one, in one day. So there's still more of these opportunities in the global market space. And then on the downside, uh, probably global trade wars, Brexit, this is probably priced in a lot, online shopping uh, impact. We've seen most of that. So talking to most companies in the USSA, department stores, they've closed most of the stores they want to close. So it's probably more shift to you, like your flexible office workspace that could turn around these uh, markets. But in general, we're pretty comfortable with the global property market. We expect better growth, better fundamentals, more uh, diversification as opposed to local property market. So that's my story, uh, local property market, offshore property markets um, in 60 slides. Thanks, Keelan. Uh, folks, we've got a minute or three. Uh, yeah, clap away first, ignore me. <laughs> Thank you.